Yeah, this is a, a great room. Um, I have been in this room before, actually. I've been, uh, the first time I came to, uh, to this program, it was Stadia, and it was in 2003. And uh, I came with my friend David Hawk, who was uh, from the New Jersey Institute of Technology. And um, uh, it was uh, one of uh, Ritva's English classes. And uh, so I asked, well, who are the students in this class? And he says, they're IT students. And I said, would you like me to give the lecture? And he says, oh, OK. And so that's why I discovered that when it comes to talking about IT, since I work at IBM, I can actually speak 75 minutes nonstop without slides. So um, the slides here are incidental. They're to help you. Uh, they are available. Uh, I want to talk to you not about my dissertation work per se, but instead about a, a new field that we're starting. And if we're lucky, uh, we'll have um, Satu sponsoring a research project on service system thinking, and we'll have you all involved in it. So this is an introduction to things that I've been working on when I probably should have been writing my dissertation because I got distracted. Uh, the slides, for those of you who have not found them yet, uh, I have a website called coevolving.com. Um, all the slides are available there. Uh, I'm also giving a lecture next week on, um, on Thursday. Uh, if people want to come over to uh, the, Creative Sustainability, the Creative Sustainability Program, which focuses on systems thinking. And so it's actually a different talk from this one. Um, there's a, there is a research paper on that website. Um, there's a story behind this. I, I started working with the pattern language community last year. And they have this um, conference. And typically, people come in with a um, two-page paper. And you have a, a poetry workshop, in effect, where they review things. And I showed up with a 40-page paper. And the reviewers were all Japanese, struggling through uh, English as a second language. So I'm trying to save that from you. So I'm going to cover some of that content. Uh, and hopefully, it won't be as painful as we had with the Japanese students. We're totally intimidated. Here's the agenda. Uh, and what I'd like to do is uh, I'll take pauses as we go along, but I want to talk about various um, ideas. The first thing is what could service system thinking be? Uh, this has been something that I've been proposing in a number of communities, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about them at the end. But the idea is about services and systems thinking together. Um, and there'll be explanations about that. I'll give you some basics on systems thinking, on what I think systems thinking is. There are multiple views on that. Uh, I'm going to talk about SSMED, which was started in 2003 uh, at IBM Research on a project called Services Science Management Engineering and Design. Um, from there, I'll talk about generative pattern language, where we start getting into the work of architect Christopher Alexander and trying to look at a different approach to, uh, to thinking about service systems. We'll talk about multiple perspectives, open collaboration. How is it that we should be developing our knowledge about service system together? And then the last, we'll be talking about how contexts are co-evolving. And this will change the way that um, I understand that the lecture after this one is about research methods. And for those of you who have not done research methods yet, there are multiple ways to do research. This is yet another way to do research. And the philosophy behind it is quite a bit different. So it'll give you an opportunity to think about how it is that you want to approach your research. Uh, so what could service system thinking be? For those of you who are, are engineers and like things, I'm going to give you an intentional representation and an object process representation. So in an intentional representation, service system thinking is a resource that can be applied by service scientists, management, engineers, and designs. And so this is um, in a notation called I-star. And you can go through it, and, and you have um, soft goals. You have agents and roles and various things. But essentially, service system thinking, the problem that we've been having in service systems is that we're so immersed in service systems, and people think are not, they're not thinking about things across service systems. Uh, one of the examples I have is, I was working uh, a couple of years ago with a director from a hospital. And, uh, and so she came into the hospital and, and said, you know, I've been working, uh, her, her, her history is that she'd been working at a telecommunications company, cable television. And so she came into the hospital and she said, I've never seen anything like this. You know, the, the, the doctors are off doing their own thing. The nurses think they run the place, the administration, the bureaucracy. There is no system that is like a hospital. And I said, of course there is. Universities. Universities are a lot like hospitals. You have the professors who don't do what they're told. You have the administration who have their own rules. You have people trying to run things. 
they run pretty well the same. But when you say that to someone in a hospital, that you run like a university, they go, no, no, everything is totally different. If that's the way we thought about industry, then we wouldn't have business schools, we wouldn't have engineering, because they say, oh, no, it's a different, it's always different. And what we should be looking for is something where there are some commonalities. So what we need is the language so that we can bridge across the different types of service systems. Okay, so we have service system thinking, and in a object process representation, we have a community, which hopefully you will be members of the community in the future. Uh, it has these parts, which are systems thinking, um, SSME, generative pattern language, and multiple perspectives open collaboration. And we can actually talk about how it is that we actually have conversations and how we should develop those ideas. Right now, I'm giving you what's called a conversation for orientation. Um, this comes from the language action perspective. So the first thing is, what is it? And what is it we're talking about? After we've had the conversation for orientation, we can have a conversation for possibilities. What is it we could do with the language if we had the language that existed? We have the conversation for action, which is how do we actually design those systems? And you also have conversations for clarification, which are we design service systems in a certain way, they're not functioning the way they should, how is it that we correct for that? So this is going through just trying to think about how we'll eventually get to service system thinking. What is systems thinking? I'll give you three parts about it. Actually, I actually have a race part 2.3 because I had another hour, so I'm going to talk about two parts of this. Uh, I'm going to talk about holes and parts and uh, evolving and learning. I was president of the International Society for the System Sciences uh, at the 2012, and I gave this talk, and the, the idea was, is system thinking, learning, and co-evolving with the world? The challenge that I see with system thinking, and I've been in um, systems thinking since the 1998 meeting of the ISSS, and that's the talk I'm going to give next Thursday, starting from, from that meeting. But when you talk to people about systems thinking, a lot of the system thinking literature stops in the 1980s. And we've learned since then, and so my question was, has systems thinking changed? Because when these people originally thought about systems thinking, the internet didn't exist. Globalization didn't exist. They thought it might come, but it wasn't like it is today. So I think that there's an opportunity for new systems thinking that we have to think about what it is that we've learned and evolved as a field. Here's the most basic definition. It's, a, it's the only David Ng definition you get. Um, I don't like actually creating my own definition. I use other people's definitions. Systems thinking is a perspective on holes, parts, and their relations. And this is pretty standard. This is a, a, um, something that goes back to the Greeks. Um, I once had to do business strategy workshops in China and through a translator, and they said they have no problems translating these things because every language has holes, parts, and then relations. And there are three major ideas within that. Firstly is function. If it's uh, a living, if it's a non-living thing, you call it a, fu uh, a function. Uh, if it is a living thing, you call it a role. But function is contribution of the part to the whole. The second is structure, which is you have part-to-part -part interactions. And that's an arrangement in space. And the third one is process, which is a part-to-part -part interaction that is an arrangement in time. And that's all of systems thinking, and it gets more complicated after that. The way you think about this, though, is as an example, in the uh, city of Toronto, we have the transit system, you have the transit system here. If you think about the containing whole, how do you think about the transit system? There are many holes that it could be in. So your, your trams here are part of the roadway system. You could think of it as part of the government, because there's an organizational hole there. There's a financial hole. And so when you have function, a system, a part, can be part of many holes. So this gets us often into discussions about when you're talking about a system, which system are you talking about? They're all valid systems, but we actually spend a lot of time trying to find out what is the system boundary. So when I say I'm talking about the transit system, do we include the trams? Do we include the rail? Do we include the bus? Do we include the ferry? And they're all different containing holes. So the ferry you have going across here, 
um, that's a different claim containing hole because it deals with water and maybe the schedule is not as frequent maybe the schedule is irregular because the water changes these sorts of things and so one of the things that we do is think about function and, and in systems thinking we tend to think about a function before we think about structure or process now here's a skill testing question and this is a hard one it took me like well, eight years before I got this question which comes first structure or process okay if people are mystified I'll give you the I'll give you the answer I got which is a good answer process comes first and why does process come first it's because process is the slowest changing structure ever so when you look at a mountain you think it's structure but the mountain changes it's just a matter of perspective on on time and what I find with most people that are really good at systems thinking is they tend to think about time when you're thinking about containing holes you don't just think about structures you think about contained containment in time so if we talk about families and you think about children you know are you thinking in terms of millennia you're thinking many generations or you're just thinking about who's around you today and what your family is today it's a different perspective Russ Acoff um, is the one that helps a little bit on, on a definition uh, I, I have what I call authentic systems thinking um, quite often, and you'll have this happen to you too, if you are a systems thinker, it is a natural sort of thing. Um, other people have to work a little bit more. But there are some people who are really bad systems thinkers. They say they think about systems and then they end up talking about parts, they never talk about the whole. And in that case, you try to figure out what's wrong. There are two ideas in systems thinking. One is synthesis, which is putting things together. The other is analysis, which is taking things apart. And what happens in good systems thinking is synthesis precedes analysis. The steps you take, as Russ Acoff says, one, identify the containing whole system of the thing to be explained as a part. So I was talking about the tram system. The tram system could be the part. What is the containing whole? Are you worried about the finances? Are you worried about the municipal government? Are you worried about the federal government? Are you worried about... Um, the impact on the, uh, on, on the climate change. These are all different containing holes. Secondly, explain the behavior or properties of the containing hole. The behavior or properties of the containing hole. So I don't know about how your system is here in Toronto. The transit system is severely underfunded. And one of the reasons underfunded is that the city actually contributes enough money and the citizens contribute enough money, but we have a province, we have a region, and the region actually contributes less money. So the reason it's underfunded is not because the, uh, the drivers are getting paid too much. The reason is the province hasn't allocated enough. And so explain the behavior of property of the containing whole. Well, the province has to look over not just the city of Toronto, but the whole region. And so they decide how to allocate. They have elected officials. You can understand the behavior if you think about that larger containing whole. And that's the third part. Explain the behavior property of the thing to be explained in terms of the role or function within the containing whole. So there's a lot of interest in uh, Toronto in maintaining the subways which go around the parliament buildings and the government uh, for the province because the uh, seat of the government is there in Toronto. And, but when you get out to the outer parts of Toronto, the transit system is not so good. So synthesis precedes analysis, one of the tricks of of systems thinking. Now there are different types of uh, systems and models and we can think in terms of purpose um, and, and this is a clarifying in terms of what types of systems because people tend to misuse different metaphors in the wrong place. So we have deterministic systems which have parts that are not purposeful and holes that are, are not purposeful. So we could talk about a engine in an automobile an engine is a part. An engine doesn't choose to be an engine. It just is. A car doesn't choose to be a car. It just is. We have animated systems. 
where the parts are not purposeful and the holes are purposeful. So your heart doesn't choose to be a heart, but you as an individual, you have choice. Now the reason it's animated is you start getting into trees and there's a little fine line here about whether you think trees have purpose or don't have purpose, but trees don't move. And so trees don't have the same sort of purpose that animals have when we move. We have social systems which can be purposeful, so we as individuals within a society can choose, and as a society, as a group, we can choose. But there are different social systems and different containing holes. The fourth type of system is an ecological system where the, there is par, there's purpose in the parts but not in the whole. So we can choose to be in this room and we can uh, set the temperature up and down, but it's really hard for us to control the weather outside. If you have a stock market, you may be able to manipulate one stock, but to manipulate, manipulate the whole stock market, that's almost impossible. So when we think about systems and you think about metaphors, quite often people come up with the animated or the organistic ones, which is the company is like a human body. There's a brain of the firm. There's a heart of the firm. And what that doesn't do is it doesn't allow you to think about cho the parts having choice. So when we think about social systems, we need to recognize that both the parts and the whole have choice. And that's where most of the complications come in in, um, in working with social systems and working with managing. Uh, in ecological systems, the fact that we start dealing with uh, groups where we don't have control over the holes gets really interesting. Uh, so if we're looking at the world and we have every country, every country has its purpose, but does the world as a whole have a purpose? Only if the countries decide to cooperate. So there, there's an ecology and it's designed that way. We can get into learning. And one of the fundamental ideas of learning, um, the, the reason there are dolphins drawn on this is that uh, Gregory Bateson created this. Uh, how many people have heard of double loop learning? Has anyone heard of double loop learning? No? Okay, I'll give you the Bateson version of it, uh, which is a, a, is a, a, it predates the one they used to teach in business schools. So Bateson wanted to understand learning, and he studied with dolphins. Uh, he wasn't actually, he was an anthropologist, but he went and he had an assignment um, in Hawaii, I believe. And so he started off with the system, the dolphin, uh, and you have the external event, which is you want the dolphin to do tricks. So um, you try to offer the dolphin a fish, and the, fish uh, the dolphin ignores you. That is a system with no learning. Okay. No matter what incentive you give it, it doesn't change. So I don't know how many of you work in organizations like that, but the fact that you're in class now probably suggests you may be working in organizations where parts of them have no learning. They always do the same thing over and over again, and they don't change. So we have a better type of system, which is a learning system, which is, uh, okay, we can train a dolphin. When the dolphin does a trick, we give it a fish. Reward, right? Quick st stimulus response. And so what happens is that the dolphin starts to recognize that you give them the fish, they do the trick, they give the fish. So if they want fish, then they do that trick. And that's called single loop learning or proto learning. We have another case where the question is, can you learn to learn? In this case, Bateson started an experiment where the dolphin comes around, does a trick, you give it a fish. Dolphin comes around, does the same trick, you don't give it a fish. Dolphin's mystified. Must be a mistake. Does the same trick again, no fish. Same, same trick again, no fish. Same trick again, no fish. Okay, now the dolphin is frustrated and acts out and does something different, just jumps out of the water out of frustration. Give it a fish. Oh, it does the same trick again. No fish. The smarter dolphins would figure out that what they were being rewarded for was doing a different trick every time. That's double loop learning. So when you think about what you're doing in your job, are you being paid or rewarded, one, for doing nothing, no learning, 
The second one, which is doing the same thing over and over again, which is efficient, and in some cases you want that. If, if it is a case where it is a risky or a dangerous situation and you want zero faults, you don't want people necessarily learning. You want them to do the proven thing. You don't want a surgeon going in every time and saying, oh, I think I'll try something new on this surgery. So no, you want, you want him to do the same thing over and over again, right? He's proven it a million times. Uh, everyone's found the best practice in medicine. But there are situations where you want double loop learning. The world has changed and you want to reward people who are innovators. Now, the people that innovate may not be the people that are, you want to do the repetitive things, right? So there are different classes of people. And, and in this case, you have the fish being rewarded for that. Now, Bateson had another category, learning three, Trito learning, which is a bit trickier because when we're talking about the first three, in effect, it's in the same environment. So you have the, the dolphin in the tank and learning these tricks and these sorts of things. If you took the dolphin and you put it in a different environment, so it's a tank that's 10 times the size, or it's out in the open ocean, would it be able to survive? And this is a really interesting experiment. Um, and and there are some people that learn triple loop learning. So it's learning to learn to learn. And um, uh, my, my friend David Hawk and I have a lot of discussions about this. And we we're talking about, uh, about how you would actually teach someone the triple loop learning. And I think I have the way to do it. Um, in, I have four sons. The pattern we had in my f four sons was uh, my eldest son took a year of badminton uh, playing with him and having this discussion. After he graduated from high school, uh, we applied to Canadian universities. And then uh, he went to China and was immersed in a Mandarin language Chinese program in Beijing for two years. Then he came back. Um, and each one of our sons after that has done it. So we have four sons who are fluent in Mandarin. This is actually Trito learning because what happens is that they went to Beijing. They actually did not speak any Mandarin when they arrived. So they're just like you. They land in Beijing and they're going to spend two years in this country where they don't speak the language. And you give, you give them the name of the university on a piece of paper that so can show a taxi driver, right? And he ends up on the front step. So I had two, two things for him to say. I said, in the first 24 hours you're there, number one, get a mobile phone and call us so we know we can, get, we can find you. Number two, open a bank account so we can send money to you. And he says, oh, that should take an hour, right? And so he goes, the first one actually takes not long. You can get a SIM card, put it in. You ever tried to open a bank account in China? Takes like six, eight hours to open a bank account. And so the first call back is always, wow, the bank account, the bank system is here. It's like, I said, no, no, you need to understand. Canadian banks are some of the best banks in the world. And so now you've now gone into a different environment. And so they now, we can drop them in. And we had this happen because um, uh, I've, I've taken my sons into places um, in uh, other countries, took them to Japan. No problem getting into Japan because Japan after China is easy. Uh, took my youngest son to France last Christmas. It's like, is this all? Like, we actually have French in the science in Canada, so what's the big difference? Paris is a really easy place to go after you've been in Canada, lived in Canada your whole life, reading French on cereal boxes, and um, you've been in Beijing. So there is Trito learning. It's possible to do that if you, if you do the right training. The last one, learning four, is genetic change. And what Bateson said is there are certain things that we can't change by choice. It is something that is built into our DNA, it's built into our way of being, and nature will change that. So nature has an intelligence that we don't have. So these are a type of learnings that we need to apply within systems, and all systems learn. So practically, um, here's something for you guys to go home at. Uh, how many of you have ever seen a video or, a mo or called um, How Buildings Learn? This, this is a book, it's an architectural book, and, and Stuart Brand wrote this book because he wanted to study organizational learning. But there were no books on organizational learning because there's no way to think about that. So he, he created this BBC series. You can go on YouTube and watch How Buildings Learn. It's entertaining. But essentially the idea is 
If you think about a building as a system, usually the way we think about buildings is that the building is a system and the people go and they change inside the system. What if we change and look at the other way around, which is the people don't change, but the building does. So what we can look at is how buildings learn and how they change over time. And here's an example of the, way that, uh, of the model that came out of this. And he now calls it the pacing layers model. So we have the site of the building. Uh, and that site is eternal. It's the thing that changes the slowest. Inside that site, we have the structure, the orange one. These are load-bearing walls. And the, the structure changes slower than the site. We have the skin on the outside that protects from the weather. So the structure doesn't get eroded. Inside the, the, the load-bearing walls, inside the structure, we have services. The services are plumbing, electricity, these sorts of things go in. We have the space plan, which is non-load-bearing walls. So I'm not sure if this wall has to be here or not, maybe not, but we decided if we want a large room, smaller room, we could move this wall without having to change the whole building. And then we have stuff, which is furniture. It could be your furniture around. So when we design systems, if you think about designing in time, you design according to the pacing layer. If you were in a house, do you want a closet or do you want an armoire? So an armoire you can store your clothes in, chest of drawers, whatever. And what's the difference between an armoire and a closet? A closet is more efficient with space because you don't have furniture running into it. but if you move, you cannot take the closet with you. And so you can design your system to be quickly changing or slowly changing, and it happens in layers. They constrain each other. So I hope this gets you thinking about time. For those of you in the logistics program, when you're thinking about designing your logistics system and you want speed, where do you want the speed? can't have everything fast, you need infrastructure. So you need to design it in layers and decide where you need speed, where it can be slower, where it can be faster, which are the load-bearing walls. Are you going to change the whole system or are you just going to do something where, oh, okay, we can make this little change and the customer will be happy. These are the way systems are designed. Talking about innovation, I, one of my favorite quotes from Drucker its innovation depends rather on what we call organization, organized abandonment. And he says, to get at the new and better, you have to throw out the old, outworn, obsolete, no longer productive, as well as the mistakes, fa failure, and misdirections of efforts in the past. And this old medical saying, as long as the patient eliminates, there is a chance, but once the bowels and the bladder stop, death does not take long. So many of you are studying this program because you want to be innovators, or you're from an organization that's looking for innovation. When I look for innovation, I don't look to add something on. I look to remove things. Think about that instead, because if you, if you come into a situation where there, are, there is no way out, what you want to do is start removing rules. People get over-constrained. So you go to a person and say, why can't you do that? Oh, there's this rule. Okay, what if I took away the rule? Okay, we could do that. Do you need that control? One of the examples we had at IBM, um, IBM stopped counting vacation time. I'm not sure how many of you are in companies like that, but when they actually did the studies, it turns out that, well, firstly, I, I, I didn't I have an office. We stopped having offices at IBM about 1993. So um, after eight years, I worked there 28 years, and after about eight years, they stopped having offices. So you can't tell who's working or not working. They're on their computer. They have performance measurements. You either make these sales or you do these consulting hours or whatever. You have your measurements. And so one of the things that people would always have is a vacation plan. But why do you need a vacation plan? You already have the measurements. So they did the cost-benefit analysis, and it turns out if you have a vacation plan, 
then the employees have to file a vacation plan, the managers have to actually monitor the vacation plan, and they need a whole computer system to keep track of vacation, when it turns out that people weren't taking their vacation anyway. When I, when I retired, from, uh, after, after 20 years at IBM, you get five weeks of vacation, so it's a lot of vacation, right? You end up taking days off here and there. But no one really cares anyway. So do you really need a vacation system? Why don't we just remove that system? Because we don't need it anyway. So if you're looking for innovation, I encourage you to think about your systems and think about what is it that we could remove and it wouldn't make a difference. I remember I, I heard about uh, when, when IBM sold the PC division and they went over to Lenovo, they had a, a celebration day which is, let's find the IBM rule we no longer le need and stop doing that because we're no longer part of IBM. It's a great festival, you could have that. Try that one sometime. Okay, so we've covered systems thinking. Uh, people have questions? You have a good idea about what systems thinking is about? Rough idea? It's, it's a big field. There are a lot of different ways and a lot of different um, aspects of, of systems and different types of systems we talked about them. Um, so if you really want it, you can come at uh, 10 o'clock next week. Um, I'm over at, uh, at Tyke. I'm over at the Arabia Compass. I'll talk about system thinking there. Yes? No specific goals. And so we'll go back to the definition that I said. System thinking is a perspective on parts, holes, and their relations. That's pretty well it. Then what happens is you start applying it to different issues. Um, so the decline in the 1980s, the 1990s, coming into the 2000s, was because when, uh, when a system has been established, uh, it doesn't require as much thinking about the whole as you think. Um, if you are going to change systems and there are changes in function, we're talking about part-whole relationships, then um, that requires a lot of thinking. So right today, as an example, um, thinking about climate change, it's a big problem and there are no obvious solutions to it, so it's a candidate for systems thinking. Um, in around the 90s, the biggest change that probably happened that was influenced system thinking was around globalization and the internet. Uh, because the whole used to be, without the technology, we had ways of communicating, and then when the internet came, it changed, the whole changed. Uh, and we're still adjusting through that. Um, in, in the technologies today, uh, what I see is, um, I'm not sure how many of you are working in the cloud technologies, Cloud technologies are a pretty major shift. Uh, they're as big a shift as what's happening with the, um, uh, with the Internet itself. So the, the change from the Internet of Things, all these sorts of things. Um, in government and with, with policy, there is, uh, when you say system and you're, and you're saying the state, um, if they say system, it could be a system where it is centralized or it's decentralized. And that's a choice that's not uh, there, there's no right answers. There is just ways that you design a system and then you come back and you change it again when you fix another way. But the state cannot never be like decentralized. The state is always, by definition, it's a monopoly of violence. That's like the minimum there. 
it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, if the, and um, it depends on, so, so generally speaking, let's just talk about political systems. We live in democracies, I live in Canada, you live in Finland. We can vote and the party that gets elected uh, is by a set of rules, which is constitutional. You can change the constitution. So uh, in Canada, one of the things that happened was uh, under British rules, it used to be that government could dissolve any time uh, up to five years, and um, the current prime minister changed the rules. It was constitutional that we have elections every four years. And that's a change in the constitution, and they can decide to do that or not do that. Um, uh, there, uh, we're coming up to an election in Canada um, on October 19th. Uh, and currently, um, as, as you have, the, 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 one of the controversies right now is that one of the parties is losing support because of wearing the niqab, wearing, wearing the gowns and, um, and the veils and all these sorts of things. Uh, and in Quebec, they don't like that. But it's part of the constitution that we have uh, in Canada. Uh, we have fr freedom of dress. We have freedom of religion separate from the state. Now, the enforcement at any point of time depends on the rules. Um, so working through government then and working through policy, you'd have questions about whether the um, judicial system is working in, a, in addition to the political system. Um, is the Senate working in relation to the House of Commons? All these sorts of things. So political systems are systems. They have the whole, which is the whole state. They have the parts, uh, which are the electorate, uh, the Senate, all these sorts of things. And systems thinking doesn't place a value on any of that. It just says you need to understand that there are functions, there are structures, and there are processes. And you can increase the number of functions, increase the number of structures, increase the number of functions, uh, uh, processes. Those are things that we, uh, we automatically do. So if you, if you want to simplify government, you could do that. You could choose to do that. Um, we have, in Canada, we have redrawing of election boundaries. Uh, it's a system that works. Um, they're talking about changing the voting system, so first past the post. So system thinking doesn't have that sort of value associated with it. Um, the people put the value in, in the design that they choose. Okay. okay. I'm going to talk about uh, SSMED. And we're going to talk about, uh, firstly, service systems, and then systems and systems, and dynamic value, just briefly. So my question is, now you've got an introduction to, to systems thinking. Is thinking different across agricultural systems, industrial systems, and service systems? So we started off, and agricultural systems are the oldest ones we have. And you have farmers, and you have a way of working the land. Uh, it tends to follow the climate of the, of the region. Um, and then we started having industrial systems. And industrial systems were different. So the story I tell is, suppose that we were at the Industrial Revolution. So I come, and uh, I see Satu, and Satu's on a farm. I say, Satu, you're working too hard. You shouldn't have to be working on a farm like that all the time. So... Um, what, what we do is, uh, you can come, and I have a factory, and when you come to the factory, I'll pay you. Um, we work nine to five, don't work Saturday, Sunday, two weeks holiday, all this sort of stuff. That's great, better than working on a farm. And I said, great, we'll see you at nine o'clock. And she says, uh, you mean sunrise? <laughs> I said, no, nine o'clock. Well, on the farm, you work from sunrise to sunset. So in the summer, you work long hours. In the winter, you work short hours. No, 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 we're inside. We work nine to five. Um, but that means that um, in the summer, we waste all those hours of daylight. And in, especially in Finland in the winter, I come to work in the dark and I go home in the dark. That's the way it works. So there are these logics that come from the agricultural era that we are inconsistent with the industrial era. So now we get into the service economy and we're in a services era. How are things different? How are things different, right? So everyone here has a mobile phone. 
I assume that you supposedly have office hours between 9 to 5. How many people answer their phone after 5 o'clock? Okay, there's a symptom of a service economy. If it were, it were an industrial economy, 9 to 5 is a way the industrial economy works. So you answer your phone after 5, it's work, you know, deal with it, and kind of like, okay, that's just kind of normal now. So think about the way you work. So my, my wife, uh, Diana, is here. Um, at, at IBM, they, they still realize they have 40-hour weeks. Uh, we used to sneak off on Tuesday afternoons to watch movies, because in Toronto they have half-price movies on Tuesday afternoons. I'm working 40 hours, it's just when you're answering calls at night and stuff like that, taking an afternoon off, what's wrong with taking an afternoon off? It doesn't work in the agricultural economy, and it doesn't necessarily work in the industrial economy where people expect you to be at your desk all the time, between nine and five, and then not at your desk the rest of the time, but a service economy works differently. It works globally, there's a lot of technology involved, and we really don't necessarily understand a service economy as well as we should. And we can change the way that we work if we understand and think about these things. So what is a service system? Uh, this is a categorization by uh, Jim Sporer. Jim Sporer is, uh, was the leader of, of Almond and Services Research uh, for IBM. Um, and in 2003, he had this really interesting challenge, which was the executives started looking at it, and for those who know IBM's history, IBM used to make its money on hardware, computer hardware, right? Um, and then it had the shift, and IBM became a services company. So the executives started looking at the financials and say, let me understand this. Okay, so IBM, half of the revenue comes from services. In IBM research, how much are we spending on researching services? 1% maybe? Okay, 50% of our revenue is in services, and 1% is on research, there's something wrong here. So we need to understand services better. So we started this program called Services Science Management Engineering Design where we went to universities and uh, essentially the, uh, the story goes like this. IBM would go to universities, then this is actually some of the foundations that brought this program in 2006 into being. Because IBM was saying, we're going to universities and we're telling universities, the students that you're graduating don't have the skills that IBM wants to hire. We can't take students from your program, and we're talking about universities around the world, we cannot take them and put them in front of customers. They don't have the skills. They don't, they, they, we have to spend a long time training them, and it's more expensive for us to train them at IBM than it is in universities. Universities say, okay, IBM, what do you want? And IBM's response was, we don't know. We don't know. Service economy, yeah, I've told you about as much as uh, i told you before. Service economy, we know something's different. We had this field, and this has happened before. We had this field, um, and in the 1960s, we, 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 we were having this problem, and we went to universities and said, the students you're producing are not, they don't have the skills we want to hire. And the math department says, we do that. And we say, that's not it. And the philosophy department says, we do that. And they say, that's not it. Electrical engineering case, did we do that? We said, that's not it. Well, what is it then? It became called computer science. So in the 1960s, if you said you were doing computer science, they go, there's no such thing as computer science. And today, it's a standard part of every university. So in 2003, IBM went to universities and said, we think we have this thing called service science, but we don't know what it is. Help us work on this. And so in 2006, when we started this program, that was the premise for the program. We didn't know exactly what we were doing. We have some clues. Um, we've had some progress along the way. Uh, and we're teaching a slightly different. But what you may see is there may be more changes because as we understand services better, we can teach in a different way. We can do research in a different way. So what is a service system? Um, Jim was working with the uh, National Science Foundation um, and they asked the question, what is, what's the difference in the curriculum? And the way he described this was, let's think about this in terms of uh, the way that we educate children from, from uh, primary school. So we can talk about systems that move, store, harvest, and process. So transportation, the very first thing for your child, when you take them to kindergarten, you walk them to school, you take them on the bus, you're teaching them about transportation systems. 
In grade one, you can teach them water and waste management, how a sewer works. The water doesn't come out of the tap, it comes from a lake, it falls from the sky. Food and global supply chain, grade two. Um, yes, food doesn't just show up in a supermarket. You could take them to a farm and show them this is where the animals are, this is where the vegetables are. Energy and energy grid, plugging something into the wall, the electricity comes from somewhere, that's a service system. And by grade four, now they've got their own mobile phone, this is the way that ICT works, with the way computer works. It's not just that you just talk on your phone to people, there's actually electronics, there's radio waves, these sorts of things. The second category of systems are systems that enable healthy, wealthy, and wise people. Building and construction is a very large industry, and people don't appreciate that it is a service industry. Banking and finance, you take your kids to the bank, understand how you put money in, get money out. Retail and hospitality. Uh, retail is a really interesting business because it can go under so quickly. Uh, businesses are really tough. Healthcare, by grade eight, it takes a while to get, get to healthcare. How does healthcare work? How do hospitals work? That's a lot more complicated than how a transportation system works. And by grade nine, you might be able to teach them about university. So they've actually been in school for nine years, and this is the first time you tell them this is how an education system works. By grade 10, you can talk about city government, because you can see them moving garbage around. You can see things that are physical. When you go to grade 11, you get region states because they're abstract, and then you get to nations, grade 12, because they are the most abstract service systems. So these are service systems which are part of our everyday society, part of everyday civilization, and they are the things that we need to change. This is where the problems are. But we need to think them not as production systems. A production system produces things and then, um, as Steve Heckel would say in the Adaptive Enterprise, they have what are called make and sell enterprises. We make things first and then we worry about selling them later. So an automobile company has traditionally been a make and sell thing. Volkswagen right now is having problems selling their cars. They make a lot of cars, that's not a problem. They can make cars, selling them is an issue. The other way you can look at it though is if you, if you change it into a service industry, you could talk about taxi cabs. When you get into a taxi cab, it is a service because you get into the car and what happens? The first thing the driver asks you, where do you want to go? You can't do anything. That's not a production system that works without a customer. So we have the distinction between buses and taxi cabs. Buses are like a production system. They run all the time. Taxi cabs are on demand. A formal definition of a service system, this is from the Cambridge Institute for Manufacturing with IBM. A service system, and it's broken out a little bit in the, uh, um, in the uh, word, wordles that goes around. Service system is a dynamic configuration of resources, when the resources are people, technology, organizations, and shared information that create their value between the pro provider and the customer through service. You can end up with provider service interfaces, customer customer interfaces, supplier supplier interfaces. So they're always social systems with a purpose. The reason we get interested in service systems is we can, we can map out the economy. This is a very old one. This was done in, uh, in 2007, and I think it was on 2005 data. But if you do left, right, you have um, products and services, and then top, bottom, you have material and information. And what's been happening with the economy is that we have the shift from right to left because we're moving away, um, we're, mo we're moving away, sorry, we're moving up to services and we're moving into information. I have to read this one correctly. So, so if you are in the green part of this, uh, where it's information and services, um, that's a good place to be. If you are in the material products in the small corner, which is like an automobile, that's a bad place to be. And, and we've had the shift towards an information services economy. And very often we have these changes now where things are platform companies. So everyone's talking about Uber and having the car company and having displacing ta taxi cabs now. That's an information service. But you have, if you are, 
if you're in this program, you're graduating, probably you are going to be uh, looking at jobs or careers within information and services. So it's a different way of looking at the economy. Another way of looking at it is uh, Richard Florida has had, done work on creative class, and you can look at the inner circle where you talk about the, the number of employees. And so most of the people are in the, um, in the blue small part, in, the, in the, uh, what was tr tr traditionally be called the service sector. And people talk about the service sector, they tend to think about um, McDonald's jobs, as they say, uh, hospitality, those sort of things. But Richard Florida has what he calls the creative sector. The creative sector is arts, um, entertainment, these sorts of things, but also includes all the professions like engineering, design, people that create new things, makers as we call them now. And the creative sector produces more than its weight of the economy given the number of employees. So these are the things that we need to understand a little bit about what the shift is and how things are different because we're no longer working in a manufacturing society. IBM had said, and this was in when was this, 2011, uh, I believe, that there's a, a $54 trillion system of systems, and when you look at service systems, this is how they fall out. So there are a large number of infrastructure services, there's transportation services, leisure services, and they're all linked together, and when you change one system, you end up impacting the others. But the opportunities for inefficiencies were seen like this. Um, healthcare in the upper right was a, a large system and it, it seemed to have the largest um, opportunity for improvement. Education could be improved, but it's actually a pretty small service system. Building and transport infrastructure is a large system. Transportation is a large system. And so opportunities for them are right, for there's a lot of change. So these are industries where there's an opportunity to use the new service system thinking. And why is service systems different? And how has the world changed in the period from 2010, say, 2005 to 2015, the last 10 years. Uh, at IBM, this is a mantra that we used to learn, which is the world had become instrumented, the world had become interconnected, and virtually all processes and things were becoming intelligent. So this is starting to get into what we now know as the Internet of Things. But if you stop and think about the converse, and think about the other side, what was the left side of this before that, when it happened? And we can think about now we have this converging physical and digital infrastructure, but before we had a world that was invisible or unobserved. So we can put tags, we can put, uh, everyone's got a mobile phone, they know where you are, all these sort of things, all these electronics are now available, so the world is now visible where things were not visible before. So you have the opportunity for big data. Uh, before, all the communications used to be analog or synchronous, and they used to be person to person and, mean to be, and, and, and machine to machine. Now with the internet, everything is coming together where there's data for everything. You have open government data um, and opportunities for work through that. Um, last of the devices, things used to be dumb or unresponsive to interaction. And so, so those of you who have played with the Arduino machines, um, you can make things now that move, you can control things electronically, digitally. These are all relatively new things. But for the service economy, what this means is that we are in this era where things that were unobservable before are now observable. And that presents opportunities for the way that we manage differently. Just to close out, one of the things about working in service systems is thinking about value. Um, this is Irene Ng's work from the University of Warwick, and I, I like her work. Uh, there's a research paper about this uh, because we get into thinking about what is value. So if you are working with a service system, it could be your mobile phone provider, it could be your uh, transit system, it could be any number of those systems, it could be your government services. Uh, what is the value you get out of that system? And you have to define what value is. So the first thing is that value is dynamic. Value changes over time, and people don't think about that very much. If you think about a restaurant example, when you are hungry, the food is actually much more valuable to you than after. So after you've eaten the meal, there's a different value for them before eating the meal. So a hamburger before and a hamburger after. So there's a consciousness ex ante, the before you eat the meal, there's one afterwards, 
And then there's, there's the phenomenological um, consciousness in the lived experience. So eating the burger gives you a sensation. These are the sort of things that we need to understand better, and you need to think about these if you are designing service systems. For those of you who work in, um, in um, software development, user-centered design, um, some of the things in social innovation around this, but centering around the role of the perspective of the stakeholders is a way of thinking about service systems. So again, uh, just to close off, uh, the service system, moving towards a service system, we have already uh, a social system science perspective. And we had uh, socio-technical system design, socio-psychological, socio-ecological. After World War II, a lot of this research that's now known as organization behavior, organization theory, all these things came out and they were research that was done. Um, and, um, and so these sorts of things are well known and they're in the business school programs. The question is, if we're looking for a service system science perspective, what is that? And there's opportunities to evolve that and change and, and, um, and develop that. So that is service science, management, engineering, and design. For those of you wondering why the program is the way it is, yes, go ahead. Yes. But, okay, let's, let's do this first. Let's do one thing. Everyone stand up. Everyone stand up. Okay. Right hand up. <laughs> Left hand up. Circles. <laughs> Other way. Okay, let's have a short conversation. Yeah. Okay, that's a good idea.